Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay, I hope? All right. Well, welcome. Um, my name is Gail O'Hara, and I'm the Manuscripts Librarian in Manuscripts, Archives, and Special Collections, which is also known as MASC and is located right behind you here in the atrium. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to give a land acknowledgement. The Washington State University Pullman Campus is located on the homelands of the Nimapu tribe and the Palouse people. We acknowledge their presence here since time immemorial and recognize their continuing connection to the land, to the water, and to their ancestors. So thank you everyone for coming and please help yourself to refreshments. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the collection and then I'll be introducing our speakers. So the Irwin Nash photographs of Yakima Valley migrant labor is one of the many collections we hold here in Manuscripts, Archives, and Special Collections. However, this one is very special as it documents uh, people that are not historically represented in archives and people whose voices are often ignored by the larger society. Mr. Nash understood that farm workers in the Yakima Valley were engaged in significant struggle for civil and worker rights, and he photographed their efforts in from 1967 to 1976. Former Mass Director John Guido bought this collection from Mr. Nash in 1991 with the support of library donors. And we are very grateful to all WSU library donors for their ongoing support of MASC. And please do feel free anytime you're in Pullman to stop by and ask for a tour. In addition, uh, and this is very special, thanks to donations from many in the Yakima Valley farmer, uh, farm worker community, we were able to digitize uh, this collection. And so now over 9,000 photographs are available online so that it's able to reach an even wider audience. And what you see here today in our exhibit is really just a sampling of those amazing photographs. And it is my honor to introduce to you our speakers for today. They are prominently featured in Mr. Nash's photographs. Lupe Gamboa and Michael J. Fox uh, were instrumental in establishing under state statutory law and federal constitutional law that organizers and lawyers have the right to enter labor camps to consult with workers. In 1971, they were arrested at the Rogers Walla Walla labor camp and convicted of criminal trespass in Walla Walla District Court and Walla Walla Superior Court. They appealed to the Washington State Supreme Court, which unanimously reversed and vacated their convictions. And thanks to their willingness to risk their freedom, the legal basis was established for organizers, lawyers, migrant assistance workers, and religious workers to enter Washington farm labor housing areas for the last 49 years. Our first speaker is Lupe Gamboa. He is the son of migrant farm workers and is a former farm worker, organizer, lawyer, and community activist. He started working in elementary school to supplement his family's income, as at that time farm workers were excluded from all protective labor laws. To fight this injustice, Mr. Gamboa joined the United Farm Workers Union and led strikes, challenged unfair legal exclusions, and won important economic and social rights for Washington farm workers. So let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Gamboa. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I also want to acknowledge, uh, see what, <laughs> I take them off, I can't see the PowerPoint. And when I put them on, I can't see you, so <laughs> anyway, the, the uh, I really am thankful to Erwin Nash, you know, for doing, <clears throat> taking all these photos. I actually remember him taking photo, photos of us when we were trying to organize back in the early 1970s, because without his camera, you know, we, all that history would have been uh, wiped away. So his, <clears throat> his uh, diligence in recording it and taking the photographs, you know, has begun to unearth the buried history of farm workers in the Yakima Valley. It seems like people are trying to forget, you know, trying to sweep it under the, under the rug. So, uh, and I also want to thank Lippi and, and the, you know, the whole uh, digit, digitization center, you know, for the time that they took and effort, you know, to put, bring these negatives to life. You know, it's really, really quite amazing. Let me, uh, <clears throat> You know, people often ask, you know, why did you get involved in the farm workers' movement? 
And I tell him I really had no choice. <laughs> I was born a farm worker. Let me show you. Uh, <clears throat> this is a photo uh, that I found of my, you know, my, when I was a farm worker. Uh, the, I'm the one at the corner. You probably can't see it, the, the little boy. And then uh, next to me is my pet dog, Tuffy. And uh, then my father, Arcadio Gamboa. So we uh, started, you know, we did, let me tell you first about my father and, and mother. <clears throat> my father, both of them were raised in Mexico. Uh, I was the youngest of nine, second from the youngest of a large family of nine. And uh, so it wasn't too far away from the Mexican Revolution, you know. They were, they were born, uh, they were children during the Mexican Revolution and suffered a lot. A lot of hunger and, uh, you know, uh, exposure to potential violence. So my father was born in a small farm in Anahilo, but it wasn't Anahilo yet. <laughs> they, hadn't, they hadn't won that yet. But then uh, he, after the revolution, you know, he, uh, he was a part of a wave of tens of thousands of Mexicans that migrated to uh, Mexico, uh, you know, to seek a better life for themselves. And, uh, you know, he had the immigrant's dream Which, excuse me, which I'm sure that all of you, excuse me, that, that our immigrants said, you know, undergone, you know, that you want to improve your life and you want to come to a place where you, your children can have a, a better life and, and better themselves. Uh, my mother was a housewife, basically, uh, but she was very, she raised, you know, on, in a migrant stream, you know, she, she raised uh, nine kids, seven girls and two boys and uh, just clothed and fed us and kept the family going. The, uh, so we settled, they, they went from northern Mexico to uh, Edinburgh, Texas, which is right by my, the border, and uh, settled down. My father started working in, in the first clearing brush for, uh, in, in, in Texas, other Texas, for preparing the way for a big agribusiness companies to come in and, and, and take over the land and build industrial farms. And then, uh, he got a job in the citrus, uh, uh, you know, growing uh, citrus trees, but then in 1949 there was a big freeze and they had to, uh, there was no work, so they had to migrate. And they heard that there was a lot of, you know, a lot of jobs in, in the Pacific Northwest. So they got in the back of a flatbed truck along with another family and all 22 of them headed, you know, from Texas to Washington, to the Yakima. And we ended up in Sunnyside in the Yakima Valley. And, uh, you know, so that's how we, we came to, to, uh, to, Sunday, to uh, this state. And the, of the nine children in the family, the five oldest were women. Uh, unfortunately, they all had to drop out of school to work, you know, to help support us because at that time, farm workers were excluded from every major piece of social legislation in the country. No unemployment insurance, no minimum wage, no child labor laws. Uh, you know, worker compensation law, so the whole family had to work together uh, during periods of, of uh, employment you know, when the crops were growing or being harvested. And uh, so, so that was, uh, you know, that's, you know, so that, you know, but they, they managed to survive, you know, and they managed to you know, get enough money to buy a truck, and pretty soon we had our own truck, and, and we started to migrate from, from Washington and, or we worked in the asparagus and, and sugar beets, moved to Oregon to work in the, in the string beans and then to California to pick cotton. At that time, they still picked cotton and then back to Washington. And uh, so what my family did is, uh, you know, indicative of, of uh, you know, what a lot of families did at that time because the, the, bracero, the agribusiness had, had implemented the Bracero or helped push for our Bracero program, uh, which are people that contracted workers that come from Mexico during World War II to come and help uh, the industry. Uh, and the same thing happened in Washington. And the growers in Washington uh, ended the program before the ones in California. And so there was a sh severe shortage of labor back in the early, uh, in the 1950s and so, and that's why the, the workers were being sought after. And uh, the, uh, you know, so it's, it's uh, I, rem the, I remember my father telling me, I guess the best way to kind of 
talk about conditions is what happened in my family. You know, I, I remember my father, a very skilled worker, far, former farmer, uh, working besides me hoeing sugar beets and, and my sisters, and we were all earning minimum wage. I mean, so mix, maximum wage was, minimum wage was, uh, maximum wage was what, every, minimum wage is what everybody earned. And uh, not only that, my, this is before the self, health and safety laws. Um, uh, my father asked me to translate, to ask the employer if he could construct toilets in the fields, you know, because there were a lot of uh, women. And the employer uh, just, just laughed and said, you know, it would be too unsightly. Why don't you have them go to the house? You know, and the house was like <laughs> a couple of miles away. And, uh, and this grower was actually one of the nice growers. He was a, not a corporate farmer, but just the mentality, you know, that, for, that workers were there to be, to be used and, and, you know, you didn't care about their dignity. So <clears throat> these kind of slights, you know, kind of left a burning desire, burning desire in me to try to do something about it. I graduated from Sunnyside High School. Uh, the, uh, at that time, I was just a, a handful of uh, Mexican-American kids. Uh, the, uh, and I remember when I migrated, um, the present that I got from my, my father and mother was a suitcase, you know, kind of the, the message, you know, now you've graduated, so, you know, uh, get out of here. And uh, the, uh, you know, but interestingly enough, neither my father or mother had had a day of school in Mexico because, you know, it just didn't, you know, they were very poor. Uh, but. They always stressed education. You know that you have to, if you want to become something, if you want to become a doctor or a lawyer, you have to go to school. And uh, you know, so I guess it sunk in because I kept on going to school. And uh, then from Sunnyside High School, I went to Yakima Valley College, and uh, with a small scholarship from Sunnyside. And uh, that's where I met uh, kind of who was to what who was to, the person who was to become my my life. <laughs> long companion in, uh, and, and best friend uh, and, and fellow organizer, Tomas Villanueva, who had a similar, you know, he also came from a farm worker background, but he hadn't been born in the U.S., he had been born, born in Mexico, and uh, he had been recruited by one of the major companies, I think it was Del Monte, to come and work in Washington, and uh, he, had, he was one of the smartest people that I, <clears throat> that I knew, but because he didn't speak the language when he got here, when he got when he got here, uh, he was about uh, you know, seven or eight, not seven or eight, about the seventh grade. You know, they, they, they didn't have any kind of classes for people that didn't speak English. They put him in the first grade, <laughs> which is crazy, you know. And, uh, you know, so he just didn't last very long. He, uh, he dropped out and became a worker. And, uh, but, we met, uh, Tomas and I met when I was at Yakima Valley Community College in 1966. And uh, because coming from the same, uh, you know, oppressed uh, situation, we started you know, talking about how we could change things. And the 60s were a time when uh, there was a lot of stuff happening. You know, the civil rights movement was occurring, the Vietnam War that was gearing up. Uh, a lot of people were dissatisfied with, with, with what was going on. And, uh, and then, the, but the most important thing to us was that we started hearing that, that uh, a man by the name of Cesar Chavez was trying to organize farm workers in California. And, and to us, that was incredible, you know, given what we had suffered in Washington. So one, of the, one night, we just decided to go to California looking for Cesar Chavez. And we drove all night and drove to the, you know, to the ritziest place, <laughs> part of Delano, California, which <laughs> there's not much there, and looking for him. In our minds, he was a pale-skinned man, you know, driving a big car, wearing a suit, and, uh, you know, because that's, that's what the dominant culture had, had put in us. And so we finally found, somebody finally directed, directed us to a little rundown house by the end, by next to a vineyard, and we asked, where's Cesar Chavez? And they said, there he is over there. And we looked, we couldn't see anybody, but then it turned out it was a, a short uh, Indian-looking man wearing clothes in the middle, surrounded by a bunch of workers. 
And I don't actually remember much of, of, of what, what he said, but you know, what, he, what struck us was a total transformation that he had, <laughs> that, that he had instilled in, in, in the workers. You know, at that time they were involved, the Farm Workers Union was involved in a major campaign uh, in one of the first elections that they held at, uh, I think it was a De Giorgio uh, uh, company. They had started, a, uh, the Farm Workers Union had started a, gra a grape strike in 1965, well, 60, 75 rather, and, uh, well, 65, right? Yeah, and then, uh, and the, the growers broke that strike because they, you know, the, they had all the power, uh, and so the, they came up with this incredible weapon, which was a grape boycott that had, uh, you know, it hadn't really been tried that much, but it was extremely effective because even though the growers could pick the grapes, you know, they couldn't sell them. And they started to mine up in warehouses and they, they incurred losses. And then finally the, uh, the growers had to sit down, the grape growers had to sit down and, and, and negotiate with them. And in 1970, they, uh, incredibly enough, the, the farm workers union with no money and, and no political, you know, no, no official political power uh, brought the, most of the grape industry under contract. And when that happened, you know, spread, sp the news spread throughout the, 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 the farm worker community about what had happened because the, the grape contracts increased wages on a yearly basis, established seniority, grievance procedure, set up a medical plan, a, bur a burial uh, plan, you know, completely different from what farm workers had experienced. And uh, the word reached uh, Washington State also uh, we had already, you know, established contact with, with uh, Delano, with Cesar Chavez when we went down. And, uh, but what, what caused the, uh, the people in, in the valley, the workers in the valley to start organizing was when a couple of the university students, uh, Roberto and Carlos Trevino, uh, you know, returned to their home in Granger and uh, they met one of their, their friends, a couple of their friends who were telling them that they were gonna quit because uh, you know, the grower never increased wages and they, asked for, they had asked for a raise and, and I think it was Carlos that said, don't quit, organize like Cesar Chavez did. And uh, so they, they went and asked the grower for a raise and the grower fired them and then, and then the Trevinos and, and especially including their, mo <coughs> their mother, Matilde Trevino, organized a community, went out and set up a picket line and in, in the Yakima Chief, Granger Yakima Chief Ranch, and that's, you know, that's how the, the strike, the, the first hop uh, strike started. There hadn't been a strike in Yakima County since uh, 1930, 30s when the Wobblies organized in the apple industry, and that strike had been brutally crushed and the leaders arrested, the growers had been deputized and the growers had arrested the leaders and put them on a stockade and ran them out of town. So, I mean, we were, we were young and foolish and we didn't know what potential trouble we could get ourselves into. But because we caught the growers by surprise, you know, the, the, you know we, we picketed that particular ranch, the Yagama Chief Ranch in Granger, and then the workers said, well, it's not having an effect. Why don't we go to the major headquarters in, in Mapton, which is about 20 miles away. And they took us there in the morning and we stopped the, the we started picketing and all the workers walked out on strike. And from there, other growers, companies uh, came, workers from other companies came and asked for, for help. And the, the hop workers strike in 1970 spread to about 13 to 15 other ranches. And, uh, and I, I was, I, I joined right after, I heard about the strike and went over and, and, and I was just waiting for this, you know, and uh, became one of the, you know, one of the people that, that really participated in, in helping to explain the workers the legal rights. And then I called legal services and they sent, my, sent me my lawyer who's here to my left, Michael Fox. <laughs> and, and we were the legal team. And uh, so because of the growers had been caught by surprise and because hops ha has to be pick, picked at the right, or harvested at the right time, otherwise they lose their, 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 their potency. Uh, the, we started, where we had started at Yakima Chief, you know, they held out, but then a, a neighboring uh, 
Gore by the name of David E. Strauss, who I think is a alumnus from WSU, uh, you know, they went over to his house and he started, he immediately started to negotiate and sign the first contract and that broke the, you know, the solid front and then all the other growers started to, uh, to also sign contracts with the exception of uh, George Gannon, who was also <laughs> an alumni of, of WSU. And uh, in the contracts, we, the, we called for an increase in wages because the wages had never gone up. You know, they had been the same uh, uh, level for many years, and uh, women were paid a dollar, men were paid a dollar fifty an hour, and women were paid a dollar twenty-five an hour for doing exactly the same labor. So one of the demands that we put in was uh, that women and men be, be paid exactly the same, and that we just go up to, uh, to $2 an hour, and we put it in writing that, that the Yakima chief uh, contract, we also put in a demand that, that the workers be given uh, a free and fair election, which, you know, incredibly enough, the company was under such pressure that they agreed to that. And uh, sure enough, several weeks later, uh, you know, we ha held the election. Oh, I forgot about my PowerPoint, <laughs> the, which I'll show you. This is a picture of the election, uh, and this is a picture of also the hop yards. You know, the hops grow on, on trellises up to the top, and they have to be cut by machinery, then they're taken to a hopper and pick the pods are picked. It's actually a very recognized industry. And, uh, and this is the first election held in Yakima County ever, or ever in the state, I think. It happened in, in uh, September 18th, and I believe 21st, 1970. And uh, the, to establish credibility, you know, we set up a committee made up of uh, two uh, local clergy, a, a very prominent Catholic priest from Yakima, Father John Hinehan, an Episcopalian minister from Sunnyside. Sorry, I forget his name, but he's the one with, uh, with the papers. And uh, it, a big grower by the name of uh, Mel. Is it Melvin Newhouse? I think it's El Melvin Newhouse. Uh, and when they counted the ballots, uh, it, was, uh, it was no contest. The workers won 103 for the union and 103 or 105 for the union and maybe, uh, or, or 105 and three no. And, uh, and everybody thought, you know, a bright day was coming ahead, you know, because the workers had finally gotten the, 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 uh, their choice, you know, their chance to vote. The local Sunnyside paper, I ran upon an old company, copied, you know, call this a new day you know, for labor organizing, it was gonna change the relations between workers and, and, uh, and growers, uh, but th that was not to be. <laughs> what happened was that uh, the, uh, and just before I get there, we also had another, after we started, the strike started to spread, you know, we had incidents of, you know, that we could, which could have gotten very violent. Uh, one at the Garza V. Patnot Ranch that, that Mike is gonna talk about, so I'll just mention, you know, but we were, showed up and we were met by, by growers with shotguns that aimed at us. And, uh, and I myself showed up at another farm and, uh, you know, the, the hop, hopper, the Hapeda was right next to the road, so I got up out to talk to the worker, workers, and the grower, the son of a grower, came after me with a bat, you know, a baseball bat. But luckily enough, the growers intervened between us and the grower, so I wasn't beat up. So, uh, but after after the the election, you know, the uh, the predictions from the from the local paper were turned out to be not not what happened. Uh, the growers. Uh, now had time to organize. They got together and, uh, and mounted a, a, a two-pronged campaign. One was to intim intimidate workers in the, in the fields and to uh, uh, <clears throat> pass legislation in Olympia where they have tremendous power uh, to stop the, the, uh, the, the unionization of, of uh, farm workers. And Mike, again, is gonna talk about that. So we held the election and the, the, so the, the 
the intimidation campaign by the employer consisted of blacklisting workers, you know, putting them on a list of not to be hired, and uh, forming a phony company union whose head, incredibly enough, was uh, the supervisor for Yakima Chief Branch and all the other foremen, and uh, the uh, and try to get the workers to sign yellow dog contracts, promising that they wouldn't join the union if they give them a job. And uh, this cre uh, really created a climate of fear in the valley. And you know, we thought we were hot shot organizers uh, because we'd call meetings, and a lot of people would come after that, camp that intimidation campaign. We'd call meetings, and nobody would come. And uh, so I think it was at that time that the, the, the farm workers union decided we needed some training, you know, that we that we had never gotten. And they summoned us to uh, to. Uh, to the headquarters, and uh, Mike and I went, and the, the Trevinos and other people, and we had two days of training by the, the Red Ross Senior, the guy that trained Cesar Chavez how to organize. And the, the main model that the Farm Workers Union used at that time was, uh, and still does, was a farm work, the house meeting campaign, where in order not to alert the employer as to what's going on, you know, you have you go to you identify the leaders, you go you do a personal visit visit to their house, and then you uh, ask him, you know, t you know, tell him about the union and the possible benefits, ask how things are going, and get them enthused and have them agree to have a house meeting a meeting at their house, and then they invite their their uh, relations and friends and. Then you have a meeting for an hour or so in the privacy of their home, and the main the main idea behind the meeting is to get other people to to, to uh, have house meetings. So you're basically using the existing networks of the, of the of farm worker community to help you organize the farm worker community, and those proved to be very very effective. You know, we were getting power, but then the the campaign started at a, at a national level in California. Uh, the growers in, in, in Salinas invited the, uh, the Teamsters in, and, uh, and the, whole, the whole union was, was threatened. So I, I went on, on the boycott, let us boycott in New York and later in Toronto. And uh, Michael also helped the, the, with the union then. And then, uh, then I, after that, I, I, I left the union for a while. I went back to school. Uh, I had started law school before. And I went back to law school and graduated and with the idea of coming back and helping the community. And uh, when I returned back in 1986 to the Valley, uh, I found out that conditions, instead of getting better, had gotten worse. You know, there was an excess supply of workers. Uh, the, growers, the growers now had computers so they could set them up to make, make it seem that everybody was earning minimum wage when in fact they weren't. They would just, they would just adjust the wages to the piece rate. And, uh, by, by then, I was a lawyer, so I, I handled a lot, of, a lot of those cases. And uh, so workers were working uh, very hard because a lot of the work, especially in the orchard, is piecework. So you have to work really hard in order to make any money. So they were working twice as hard and not even making minimum wages. And uh, so the, uh, but then IRCA, the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, was passed. And uh, you know, so it gave workers hope. You know, then started you know, a lot of strikes started to occur again uh, in the apple industry this time, in the asparagus industry. The uh, so you know, but again, be, because of the lack of protections, you know, that none of the none of the uh, none of the uh, the organizing uh, efforts uh, produced any uh, fruitful results, with the exception of one, which is. Uh, a campaign against Chateauce Michel that started in 1987. Chateauce Michel was the biggest winery and grape grower in the, by this time in Washington State. And the, the, again, the, the campaign started, the, the dispute started over wages. Workers were pruning, uh, using a, a pruning machine, tethered to a pruning machine. They had been paid by the hour, then the company on their own decided to change at the piece rate and they were working twice as hard on the piece rate, but not making minimum wage, and, or, or at least not making what they were making before. So they walked out of a strike, they were fired. Uh, they, they came to, to, uh, to us, at, at, at that time I was working with legal services, and uh, we said, well, this, this seems like, uh, like a, you know, a, a violation of the, a law that Michael helped establish, uh, you know, that workers have a right to help us, to, to self-organize to improve their terms and conditions of employment. 
and we filed a com campaign against Chateau Saint Michel in uh, about 1987, and uh, and it worked there because they had a very identifiable brand, the Chateau Saint Michel, and they also had a big target, which is uh, the company was located in Seattle, and uh, it was a popular uh, music venue, and. Uh, after seven years of, of organizing, uh, the uh, you know the we even mounted a or the union at that time it was a farm workers United Farm Workers of Washington State led by Tomas Villanueva at this point uh, the, uh, the so they did the boycott and then uh, we also did a corporate campaign where workers attended. Uh, uh, the, the meeting of their their owner, uh, U.S. Tobacco. See, and this gives you a size of the, of the scope of these companies. You know, it seems like they're local growers, but when you dig down, you know, a lot of them are parts of major corporations. And uh, so, <clears throat> the, the corporate campaign, along with the boycotting and the continued picketing of, of Chateau Saint Michel, finally uh, got them to agree to an election. We set up an election commission uh, that was chaired by by the venerable. Tom Foley, the former head of the House of Representatives from Spokane, and an election was held, and when the votes were counted again, the only other uh, union election allowed uh, for farm workers that workers won, and they, they signed their first contract. And that was, that was a really major accomplishment uh, because they got, uh, they got whatever, what the workers had gotten, the industrial workers had gotten after the passage of, of the New Deal legislation. Uh, uh, Higher wages, agreements, procedures, seniority, uh, health and safety protections, and uh, and but very you know a medical plan and a dental plan and uh, a uh, pension plan you know all you know which is unheard of at, at farm worker in a farm worker uh, community and, uh, and and this is basically what workers were had been fighting for all along the. Uh, how much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay. <laughs> so, so the anyway, so the going was very slow as far as organizing, but uh, you know, what it showed is that you can't just uh, you know there was a, a strike at Pyramid Orchards that lasted about three months. You know, a big grower uh, in Yakima, and it, it was done during pruning season, so you know it didn't work, and then. Uh, so if you if you want to win, you got to have a, 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 a big company, you know, that has a lot of places where you can leverage, put pressure on them. You got to have a brand, and, and you got to have support of the community. And this is what worked for us, and this is what Cesar Chavez and the Lord of Huerta originally established in California when they won the 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 grape the first grape contract. Yeah, it was through the. They're, they said we're, they sent the, their organizers, along with like clergy and other people, to all the major cities and stopped the sale of grapes. And uh, so we've tried that technique again and again. And I want to show the uh, I want to show you since about time for me to to wrap up. Yeah, this is this is the uh, a photo of oops. oops. Chateau Saint Michel after the workers after they won the election in 1985, and uh, I was talking to one of the leaders who still works with with the union uh, enforcing the contract, and he said that about half of, the, of those original workers have now retired because they, they all stayed there because it's it's such a good place to work, and under the, the contract they can they can retire, you know, which again is unheard of. And there's other strikes and boycotts that, that have taken place uh, during this period of time uh, from the 19, you know, from the late uh, the 2000 to, to the current, uh, the current date. Uh, in 2007, 2007 uh, again through uh, through a, a big corporate campaign against a company, a Three Mile Dairy, uh, the biggest factory uh, dairy, I think, in the U.S., uh, the workers walked out on strike. They didn't even walk on a strike. You know, there was a campaign started against a company, and uh, the 
the workers signed the you know there was a the election of the workers won and they 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 also won a a, a, a collective bargaining agreements. Uh, workers at, at those three uh, uh, beef workers at those three operations also uh, won uh, union contract. And what's interesting now is that there's another union uh, called the. It's based in Burlington, in the Skagit Valley. It's called Familias Unidas por la Justicia. Uh, they, they, again, they use a model employed by Cesar Chavez, you know, the local organizing, uh, getting the, the work base solid. And then uh, uh, in this situation, they also had big targets. You know, uh, Costco was a major buyer of the grapes, and Costco has a rep reputation for being better than the others. And uh, so it was also a multi-year campaign, but they won the election. And then just recently, uh, like within the next last two weeks, uh, again, the, the Familias Unidas por la Justicia uh, struck the, the major tulip grower in Skagit County because of you know, bad working conditions. They didn't have gloves and other safety features. And, and uh, there was a, uh, they hadn't been paid correctly. They walked out of the strike. And what's interesting about this, well, two things, is that the strikers were all indigenous uh, workers, you know, from, from Oaxaca. And, uh, you know, people used to think that you couldn't organize them, but it turns out that they're one of the, the you know, the best you know, to, to organize because when they get together, you know, they don't, the, they, don't they stay organized. So the, so the workers went out on strike and, uh, Three days before the major tulip and, and the tulip and what's the other one and daffodil festival, again you know a, a point of extreme vulnerability for the company, and the, the workers actually, the, at first the employer refused to meet with them, and then uh, when they said they were going to continue picketing through the through the festival, you know they relented and they agreed to the the demands and said that they could talk about you know the rest of the stuff like union representation after the. Uh, the, the festival, so it looks like they're going to get something. And what's interesting about this one is that the uh, about 60% of the workers that work at, at the Washington Bulb uh, are also also work with the Sakuma Brothers, which is a, the major strawberry workers that strawberry worker that already has a contract. Uh, so there there is something happening. But and just briefly covering, uh, in addition to to kind of the local organizing, and uh, there's also been major court victories, and I'll just list them here, you know, uh, briefly, you know, Michael's gonna talk about some of these, but uh, workers have now, you know, as I mentioned before, the workers had no, no legal rights. Now, uh, you know, the first two that Michael's gonna talk about is Garza and State and Macias, actually, I think. Well, you're gonna talk about all those four, right? And. Uh, and then there's also another one against Sakuma Farms uh, that, that held that peace raid workers have to be paid for rest breaks apart from the peace work, uh, their peace raid work. And, Mart this is, and the other one is a really major victory. Martinez Cuevas v. De Ruder Brothers Dairy uh, says that workers, or farm workers are entitled for, for paid overtime after 40 hours and uh, plus a 40 hour work week. And you know, which again was unheard of, and uh, the but but all is all is not good and fair in the fields. Or the uh, workers are still a, a, a isolated minorities and highly racialized environment, country, society. Uh, vulnerable immigrant women are are uh, subjected to sexual abuse. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, cases filed by legal services on that. Uh, the, there's been a tremendous growth in, in uh, H-2A contract laborers. You know, the, the latest work order from, from, from the growers calls for more than 30,000 H-2A workers. Uh, and, uh, you know, this, this has a tremendous impact. Uh, I mean, it, it, if you had had H-2A in, in, uh, in existence when my parents came over to work, I wouldn't be here because you know, work, H-2A workers have to work and then they're, they're sent back home. Uh, so they, they never require, acquire rights to residency, to citizenship. And uh, the, uh, they also aren't fully protected under the law. 
they, uh, they don't get Social Security, they don't get uh, uh, workers' comp, and uh, women workers are discriminated against both in Mexico and in the U.S. because growers get to select who they want. They only pick young male workers to bring over, and then when the young male work, uh, H2A workers work here, you know, it creates problems for women workers because they can't keep up with them, and, uh, you know, it's just created a really bad mess, and, but it keeps, uh, you know, what they really should be doing is, is doing an, another am amnesty program. If they need the workers, they should legalize them and, and allow them to, to have the full rights of citizenship. The, uh, there's still a, a lack of collective bargaining for, for farm workers, yeah, you know, like, uh, you can, you can make, you, you can organize, but you have to use just pure political power, uh, economic power to get them to agree to anything. Uh, and there's, because of this, uh, there's a, a great inequity in, in, uh, in, in the bargaining power between the work, workforce that's, that's uh, a lot of them are, like I mentioned, are minorities and, uh, and the, uh, the grower community that's entrenched and, and, and dominates a lot of the rural areas and has a tremendous power in Olympia, where its workers are very uh, sparingly represented. And uh, the, the, this, this uh, kind of the bad situation of workers and it was, was really demonstrated during the COVID epidemic, pandemic, you know, where, it's, where foreign workers were about two or three times more likely to get sick and die from COVID than, than regular workers because, you know, lack of health care, you know, they were deemed essential workers and had to work under very unsafe conditions. It's pretty ironic, you know, they, they're essential, but they, they don't have the rights of other workers still. And uh, so what, what I want to end up saying is that that, that uh, it, it's time to, for people, especially for youth that are here, you know, it's time for people to roll up their sleeves and make good trouble, like, like uh, John Lewis used to say, good trouble like we did in the hop harvest and <laughs> the, uh, how we went and organized at Olympia. Uh, get training, any training opportunities on, on organizing that you have, because it's all basically boils down to power. Who has a power, you know, to, you know, to win in, in an economic struggle. And you learn by doing, and uh, lastly, do what your parents did when they were young. If you'll see, don't, don't go without looking at this excellent exhibit in the back, you know, where you see a range, wide range of young people that, that are now my, and, and my, my age, you know. They were young ones, but they became uh, radicalized then, and uh, so, uh, do as your parents did and uh, begin to advocate for change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Michael J. Fox. He is a retired civil rights activist, labor lawyer, and judge. He represented Yakima Valley farm workers from 1970 until 1988 when he became a judge with the King County Superior Court. As a judge, Mr. Fox carried on his fight for equity and social justice by highlighting the unequal sentences passed on juveniles of color. And let's welcome Michael Fox. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me say that I've always considered myself a coog ever since I arrived in this state 53 years ago. I went to uh, schools in the Northeast and law school in the South and uh, came out here in uh, 1969 and almost immediately got involved with representing farm workers in Eastern Washington. And now uh, my partner, Carrie Radcliffe, who's in the back row there, graduated from WSU in 1975. I, so I've always rooted for the Cougs since then. <laughs> All right, 1995, I forgot, yeah, okay. Um, I had met Lupe in the uh, spring of 1970, and he was in law school at the University of Washington at that time, and he visited our office at Seattle Legal Services, and I immediately started talking to him about farm workers because I had been long interested in uh, the plight of farm workers in the United States. And I, had, uh, I was particularly interested in this because I spoke Spanish. I had uh, taken three years in high school and a year and a half in college, 
And I worked at it, and I went to Mexico for about six weeks in the summer of 1964, and so I could speak fairly well for uh, Anglito. Uh, and so when the strikes occurred in 1970, I spoke with the director of the Legal Services Program uh, in Seattle, Greg Dallaire, my very good friend, and he basically sent me to the Yakima Valley. And so what do I find when I get to the Yakima Valley? I find Lupe, the Trevino brothers, uh, Tomas Villanueva, a uh, number of other people who were actively involved in administering these strikes. And I think on the first day I was there, I was sent out to uh, a picket line outside of a hop ranch. And there were a lot of things I didn't know, and I think also my colleagues, the organizers, didn't know at that time about the hop industry. One thing was, with these strikes, we really had the growers over a barrel. And uh, we didn't know it at the time. We had them over a barrel because, as we learned later, there's a very sh short window when hops can be picked and sold at their, for their maximum value. And it depends on the, the content of the alpha resins in the hops, which gives the flavor to beer. And so if they're not picked, these different varieties, within about a two or three day period, uh, it loses value because when the hops are taken to market, that the alpha resins are measured, and that's what the compensation is based on. We didn't know any of that, but we knew that the growers were very angry, and they were very angry of these strikes because of the pressure it was putting under them, and we did know about their anger. So I get out to this picket line, and this is my first experience doing this. I'm 26 years old, and um, there are a bunch of farm workers with picket signs, organizers out there, and then all of a sudden I notice a Yakima County deputy sheriff. And uh, he was a rather tall man, and I had known about what the uh, sheriff's departments in California had done to the UFW, and there had been a lot of really uh, untoward acts and beatings and arrests and everything else. And he's coming over towards me, and I'm thinking, oh, Jesus, you know, this is the end of my uh, career in this particular role. So he comes up to me, says, you a lawyer? And I said, well, yes, sir, I am. He says, you represent these guys? Well, yeah. Well, look, uh, what can we do to get these guys back to work? I mean, and this really shocked me because <laughs> I thought he was going to just threaten us. And it, it's, I had this stereotype in mind about law enforcement, and this guy broke it. He, uh, he said, you know, I really should be out running up and down the highway here, uh, finding drunk drivers and people are speeding and stuff like that. So what can I do to help these people get back to work? So he basically said, I'll be the go-between between you and the grower. So I, I said, well, what, you know, what we want to do is we want to end this bonus system, which the workers uh, hated, and we want some higher wages. And he said, well, how much? And I said, well, you know, maybe 50 cents an hour, something like that, you know, so that it goes up to close to $2. And he said, well, let me go talk to him. So the sheriff goes, and he's acting as a mediator between the workers <laughs> And the grower. And we, uh, we had a, I had a yellow pad like this, and I had my car there, and I write out on the hood of the car a very simple contract in handwriting. And the, the, the sheriff takes it over and shows it to the grower, and then the grower comes over and talks to me, and we sign a contract on the hood of my car, and the workers go back to work. And uh, it was an incredible experience for someone who'd had no experience doing this. Now, during this period of time, the workers were meeting, and there were about, they, were, they had gone out on strike at about 15 ranches, hop ranches, and they were meeting almost every night in a movie theater in Granger, Washington, which is population about 3,000, a very old but sm and small movie theater. And um, it came and it was voted on uh, one night, early, this is early in the strikes, that they wanted to affiliate with the UFW. And uh, so they asked me, what can you do to put us in touch with them? And Lupe had had contact with you know, the UFW prior to that. I had had none, but I found out that the general counsel of the, the, the head lawyer for the UFW was a guy named Jerry Cohen. And so I managed to find Jerry Cohen in Salinas, California. I explained to him what was going on, and he said, well, hold on, and I'll, I'm going to call you back in 10 minutes. So apparently during that period of time, he talks to Caesar, and Jerry calls me back and he says, stay right there, Caesar's gonna call you. 
And I, and I immediately said to the organizers, this isn't a role for me. I shouldn't be talking to Cesar Chavez, you know. Uh, but the workers said, no, we want you to talk to this guy and explain what's going on. And I did. And uh, I, I explained what was going on to Mr. Chavez. And, you know, he said, well, if, you know, you want, if they want us to get involved, we'll get involved. And then he said, put me in touch with one of the workers who's actually out on strike. So they had a conversation in Spanish for about 15 minutes. And it was everybody in the room was elated. This worker went out and explained what he'd done. They'd talk with Cesar Chavez. And uh, it really lifted everybody's mood. Now, uh, one of the things that Lupe mentioned is that under the, uh, you know, during the, the, all of the New Deal legislation that came down in the 1930s, one of the key acts was the National Labor Relations Act, which guaranteed a federally guaranteed right to organize, free of employer intimidation. But when that law passed, the agricultural lobby was very, very strong, and was particularly in the southern states, where there were all Democrats at that time, but they were from the southern states in the 1930s, so you can guess what their racial attitudes were. And who were the farm workers in the southern states in the 1930s? Black folk. So the, the, basically, the Southern Democrats said, we will go along with this National Labor Relations Act and allow workers to organize and not be harassed by employers, but you got to exclude farm workers. And that's what happened. So there was never a federally guaranteed right to organize for farm workers. And um, Lupe had told me about this 1965 Washington State Supreme Court case called Kristad versus Lau. It involved a small Seattle area laundry. And those workers weren't covered under the NLRA either because they were below the floor of the number of employees you had to have in a business to gain that, record, to gain that right. I think the floor was then 15. So the Supreme Court of Washington State said, you know, there's, a, there's another statute in the state that gives all workers in the Washington State the right to organize. And that decision came down five years before these strikes occurred. So what happened next? Well, I mean, uh, sometimes terrible things happen, but they can have a good effect on the development of the law. In uh, September 11th, uh, 19, uh, 1970, workers at the Patnode and Real Hop Ranch in uh, just outside Grandview, Washington, were out on strike. And Roberto Trevino, uh, Carlos Trevino, Lupe uh, Gamboa, and others were present during that time, and they presented some demands to the grower. And I've, I've got that decision here. This was the lawsuit that we filed very soon after that date, and that we won in January 1971. It was the first significant case, frankly, that I'd ever handled. Um, I'll just read a couple of excerpts from this opinion by uh, Judge Richard Patrick of the Benton County Superior Court. And Judge Patrick was a very conservative judge, I mean, politically. And all, judge, all Superior Court judges in the state are elected. And in Benton County, uh, the politics were uh, very conservative and very dominated by agriculture. But Judge Patrick was a man of real intellectual integrity and courage. So here's some of his findings. At approximately 1 p.m. on September 11th, 1970, Roberto Trevino and Michael Fox met with both of the defendants in Mr. Patnode's home, and a rough contract was prepared. On September 12th, Roberto Trevino and Fox returned to the Patnode ranch at about noon. Defendant Real signed a contract with the union at that time. Defendant Patnode was not present. Uh, so we had a contract signed with one of these growers. And here's a little bit later in the findings. After Patnode escorted the, escorted the union representatives to the road on September 16th, 1970, he went to his house, obtained a rifle from the utility room, carried it across the yard in front of the hop processing plant, and laid it down on the left front fender of a boom truck located 275 feet from the public road. Patnode's son also had a gun and was carrying it uh, near the hop processing plant. 
After Wheel returned from the public roadway, this is the guy who already signed a contract five days earlier, he obtained a gun from his trailer, uh, his trailer house located near the hop processing plant, loaded it outside the trailer in full view of the employees working in the vicinity. Uh, and then earlier, five days earlier, when we had been discussing a contract with both of them, this occurred. On September 11, 1970, during the negotiation in which a rough contract was prepared, Real stated to Roberto Trevino, who is of Mexican-American origin, that if there was any more trouble, there would be some dead beaners in the road. Now, I'd never heard the term beaner. Roberto later explained to me that it was a derogatory term used by people in the West about Mexican-Americans. Nonetheless, the union went ahead and signed this one contract. Um, and uh, he also told uh, Roberto uh, when he called the next day, uh, this is Pat Mode, at that time, as part of this telephone call, Pat Mode did threaten Roberto Trevino if he showed his face back on the Pat Mode property. Now, these, these things occurred, and they, uh, they led to the issuance of an injunction that we obtained and a legal conclusion that I'll just read now that was very important, which established a, farm, a, a right to work free of employer intimidation for farm workers. Farm workers enjoy the same rights under state law as do all other workers in the state of Washington. RCW section such and such guarantees that farm workers have full freedom of association, self-organization, and designation of representatives of their own choosing to negotiate the terms and conditions of their employment. He then went on to hold that the growers, both of them, had violated those rights and that we were entitled to the issuance of an injunction. Now, at the trial, race was always involved in this case. And one of the things I, I remember vividly in the testimony is uh, I was cross-examining Mr. Patnode, and one of the questions I asked was, Sir, what is the racial composition of your workforce, which was 100% of Mexican descent? And he said, well, we've had Negroes, we've had Mexicans, and we've had Americans. I mean, you know, that just shocked me. And I was so inexperienced in trial that I objected to the answer because I said it doesn't, de Americans doesn't designate a, a racial composition. And the judge looked at me like, you damn fool, that's the most effective testimony you've elicited all day, and thankfully denied the motion. But he got the message that race was involved. Now Lupe mentioned about the case where the two of us were arrested. This occurred about three or four months after that trial. After that trial, Lupe and I and the Roberto, the Roberto and Carlos Trevino went to many labor camps involving Green Giant, uh, Del Monte, other big asparagus growers in the, in the Yakima Valley. And I went with them and sometimes we took copies of the decision I just read from to show people, you have the right to organize. And um, after that, I mean, I think I, this was probably the 15th or so labor camp I'd been in with union organizers. In June of 1970, Lupe had been to the Rogers Walla Walla camp, and he asked me to go with him because there was a guy named, there named Alfonso Romo, who testified in the subsequent trial, who wanted legal assistance for these 220 workers who had been brought up in school buses from Eagle Pass, Texas, to work for the Rogers Walla Walla Corporation picking asparagus. Uh, so on a Saturday, I drove from Seattle with Erwin Nash, the photographer, uh, met Lupe and two other union volunteers in uh, Sunnyside, and we drove down to Walla Walla. And we got there after working hours. We entered the camp, and we were immediately greeted by an armed guard in a Walla Walla sheriff's deputy uniform. We later found out that he was not a deputy sheriff, he was a supernumerary officer, is the term they used for him, but that the, uh, uh, the sheriff had authorized him to wear a uniform. 
So this is a camp guard. You know, basically these people had been brought up from out of, ta out of state, taken to this labor camp, and they were just being held as de facto prisoners. And we went in there, the guard asked me uh, what I was doing there, and I said, well, I'm a lawyer. There's people here who want legal assistance. I gave them a copy of what looked like a credit card at that time, was my bar card, uh, which said that I was a member of the Washington State Bar Association. Uh, he goes in and he makes a phone call. In the meantime, Lupe gets uh, some workers and we sit around talking about what they want help with. They showed me the copy of their employment contract. They showed me their living quarters. They uh, uh, told me about some of the things that had been done and the poor wages they were paid. And I was starting with a recorder that we had with us that Irwin had brought in to dictate an affidavit. Uh, then. Uh, two sheriffs arrive in a Walla Walla County Sheriff's Department car and um, we're met with them and they say, well, if you don't have permission from the landowner to be here, you have to leave. And I said, well, we're not going to leave. We have a legal constitutional right uh, to be here and we're going to stay. Uh, and then I remember turning to Lupe and saying, well, what do you think? Uh, you know, they're going to arrest us. And we made the decision that the two of us would be arrested. Uh, one of the things I said to one of the sheriffs, who's a guy named Geo Scotty Ray, was that uh, there's a case called Marsh versus Alabama that was decided by the Supreme Court of the United States in 1935. It was about a, it was about a company town in a southern state where a guy was passing out leaflets. But all the land was owned by the company that ran this, that owned this town. And he, you know, the guys basically said, hey, you know, give me a break. I'm just a Walla Walla County Sheriff and uh, you got to leave. You know, I said, well, we're not leaving. So we were arrested and we were taken down to the Walla Walla County Courthouse. Uh, Irwin and the two other volunteers had left in my car and uh, we were booked. And a guy named Jerry Votendahl, who was a deputy prosecuting attorney, uh, came in, we talked with him shortly, and he basically said, well, you're not going to go right back out there, are you? And I uh, said, no. He says, well, all right, but well, we're going to uh, authorize your release. We're not going to hold you in jail overnight, which was nice. And uh, uh, we left, uh, tried to figure out what we needed to do next, and uh, we uh, met with some of the workers who actually came into town that night, and we ran into them and talked with them. So the next, that was a Saturday night, and Sunday morning, uh, Lupe and I went back out to the labor camp to take some pictures of the camp, and Irwin was with us. And one of the pictures he took is in the La Casa exhibit of Lupe and I shaking hands over the no trespassing sign, a picture that is hung on my wall for 50 years. And uh, uh, this case, we, we went to trial in the Walla Walla District Court and we were convicted in a very short trial by a Judge Howard Martin. And after we were convicted, uh, you have the right of allocution to say something. So um, the judge asked Lupe, well, is there anything you want to say? And Lupe said, I'd just like to quote Victor Hugo, nothing can stop the force of an idea whose time has come. And I had seen that on a Union poster, the UFW poster. And I figured, well, I got to say something. And there were, in the courtroom, there were probably 20 farm workers who had come to attend this trial. And most of them were monolingual Spanish. So I said in Spanish, quoting Emiliano Zapata, prefiero morir de pie que vivir de rodillas. I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees. And so the judge then says, okay, you're fined $25. <laughs> and so Lupe and I have been kidding, our, kidding each other for 50 years about our pomposity as 26-year-olds, uh, quoting Victor Hugo and Emiliano Zapata. All right, so the case goes to trial, uh, I mean, uh, goes to the Supreme Court, and I'll get that to that in a minute. After we had had this sort of uh, out front success, there was a legislative session in 1972 where the growers somehow got together with the labor lobby, the Washington State Labor Council, 
and put together a bill that was to cover people who weren't covered by uh, the National Labor Relations Act, small employers and agricultural workers. But what they did, and the labor lobby bought into, was to set up an election scheme that would take about six months. And uh, in agricultural work, people don't work for the same employer for more than two or three months at the most. So this bill would have just made it almost impossible to organize farm workers, have an election, get it certified, and then proceed to collective bargaining. So we uh, were opposed to the bill. And we uh, uh, went out of the legislature and uh, uh, made as clear a case as we could to the friendly uh, legislators. The one who helped us the most was Senator Martin Durkin. Uh, Martin Durkin was the father of Seattle Mayor Jenny Durkin, who just retired. And he was really good for us, and he didn't give a damn about offending the labor, the labor lobby. He said, this is right. You know, we cannot, we just can't do this. So, but we, it looked like it, was, it looked really bad for us. So uh, I think Roberto Trevino called uh, uh, Caesar, and Caesar said, well, I'm sending Dolores Huerta up. And Dolores was the second in command of the Union. President Obama awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. She's now in her 90s, but she's still pretty vital. And she came up to help us in this lobbying effort. And the one thing I remember vividly is one of, the, of our real enemies was a senator named Bob Grieve, who was from West Seattle. And he was just totally in the, in the uh, pocket of the Labor Council. And he was going to just sell us out. So Dolores, who's about five feet tall, goes up to Grieve, and I'm standing right, right next to him. And she says, uh, Senator Grieve, my name is Dolores. And in Spanish, that means sadness and pain. And if you don't turn this around, you're going to experience mucho sadness and mucho pain. And he just looked shocked. He wasn't used to being talked like to like this. So he goes, he says something demeaning to her and he walks off. Well, Dolores calls Caesar. Caesar calls Teddy Kennedy. And Teddy Kennedy calls his close friend, Scoop Jackson, the very powerful senator from the state of Washington. And Scoop Jackson calls Bob Grieve and says, in effect, what the hell are you doing trying to deny farm workers the right to have a union? So Grieve collapses. And he sees us the next day, and he says to Dolores and to me and to, I think, Roberto, who was there, I don't know what you did, but don't ever ask me for anything ever again, which was much, not much of a loss because he hadn't done anything for us. <laughs> so uh, after that, we go to trial in the fall of, uh, 72, I think, no, maybe the, the winter of 71, this is before the legislative session, on a retrial in Wallaca Walla County Superior Court uh, on the State versus Fox and Gamboa case. Uh, we also had the assistance of Mario Obledo, who was at that time the general counsel of the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, and an extraordinarily persuasive and charismatic speaker. And uh, my lawyer was my very good friend, Charles Ellert, who was very scholarly and had done a lot of good work and had written brilliant briefs. And the two of them were uh, very effective counterpoint with uh, uh, Obledo using very emotional arguments and questions and, uh, and uh, Ellert really being very technical and unemotional. But we were convicted again. So this time when we were asked to, if we wanted to say anything, both of us shut up. And uh, uh, the case went on its way to the state Supreme Court. Now, I can remember the day of this argument vividly. This was in the, I think, in October of 1972, after the legislative session I had just mentioned. So uh, I remember seeing the prosecutor, who was a fellow named uh, uh, Jerry Votendahl from Walla Walla, uh, who was a deputy prosecuting attorney. And um, I said something to the effect like, well, Jerry, we're playing in our ballpark today. <laughs> and he just kind of, you know, said something sarcastic. And uh, 
Uh, and then uh, Carlos came in the courtroom, and we're at the State Supreme Court uh, hearing room. It's a big, ornate room with ceilings about as high as this, very formal place. And usually, no, no spectators would come to these Supreme Court arguments. I mean, the only people would be lawyers who were interested in hearing other lawyers talk. Well, all of a sudden, 80 farm workers walked into the Supreme Court courtroom. They had been uh, brought over by the UFW organizers. They all sat down with their very clean, neat, pressed clothes. And despite the fact that very few of them spoke any English, they stayed there and they sat very respectfully during the argument. And um, when it, after we had finished our arguments, which because we were the appellants, we went first, then Jerry Votendahl got up to argue. And he started giving this, uh, his argument. Justice Hugh Rossellini on the State Supreme Court interrupted him after about three sentences and asked him this question. Mr. Votendahl, where in the statutes and constitution of the United States of America and the state of Washington does it give you authority to bring people up here from Texas and hold them prisoner? <laughs> and I leaned over to Charlie Ellert, my lawyer, and I said, well, I think we got one vote. And uh, the, the decision cut, did come down in June of 1973. I was by that point working directly for the UFW in uh, Washington, D.C. as the so-called National Council. And uh, I got the word that the decisions had been reversed and uh, later got the opinion. It was a very simple, fairly short opinion. And uh, it did establish unanimously that uh, people, pe lawyers and union organizers had a right to go into labor camps and speak with people there and assist them. And uh, as Bonnie mentioned, it did, it did result in religious workers being able to go into labor camps, uh, other people, even uh, the, uh, um, I forget the name of it now, but it was a cosmetic, said the Avon, the Avon ladies could go in after work and, and talk to people. All right, now, uh, I want to talk just briefly about one other case. Uh, in about 1977, we filed a case against the Border Patrol on behalf of residents of labor camps in Washington State, Oregon, and Idaho, because the Border Patrol was conducting what were called, uh, we called them, labor camp raids. And the, uh, uh, they would not have any search warrants. They'd go in and interrogate people. And I'm just going to read briefly from the decision by federal judge Robert McNichols, where he describes the normal practices that were carried out. During the years 1974 through 1979, INS Border Patrol agents and criminal investigators have regularly conducted surprise searches or raids in these farmer labor camp areas. The evidence reflects that through the years, these activities generally followed a standard pattern. One, the searches were conducted primarily during hours of darkness or daybreak when workers would normally be found in their living quarters. Two, most if not all of the officers were uniformed, wore badges, and carried pistols, handcuffs, and flashlights. Three, the officers approached the housing areas in government-marked vehicles, including van-type vehicles, suitable for detention of those arrested. If possible, the officers sealed off roads or paths leading out of the housing areas. Officers were also stationed at the rear of the housing units to prevent departure of the occupants. Five, officers then proceeded from door to door within the camp, knocking on doors and interrogating residents concerning their citizenship status and the status of other persons within the particular residence of the camp, including children. Occupants who exited from the rear of the sides of the units were apprehended, detained, and interrogated. Those believed to be illegal aliens were arrested. Six, when residents opened doors, officers attempted to engage them in conversation in English to determine if the residents spoke English or had a noticeable accent. Seven, if the officer believed that the person at the door was an alien, 
or that aliens might be present inside the residence, he would ask for permission to enter the residence to search for and interrogate occupants. Remember, this is uh, at like four or five in the morning. Agents of the Spokane sector had never obtained warrants for such surfaces, such searches, never. Nine, and finally, officers routinely checked the farm labor housing areas on the basis of anonymous telephone tips concerning aliens in the, far, in the housing area, information that illegal aliens had been apprehended in the camp in the past, or merely because they happened to be in proximity to the housing area. Now, one of the arguments we made in the federal court when we tried this case in 1982 was that, can you imagine what would happen if this type of search took place in an urban area as opposed to a labor camp? What people would say? But, you know, the, uh, these people were cowed. They were terrified of these Border Patrol agents. And, you know, they would uh, they'd just submit. And uh, finally, one day, uh, they went into a labor camp in the Sunnyside area, and there was a guy named Chuck LaDuke who was a, a uh, Anglo who was living in a tent in a labor camp and uh, uh, doing farm work with all the other residents of the labor camp. And at about 4.30 in the morning, this Border Patrol agent shines a flashlight into his tent and says, uh, Buenos dias, senor. So Chuck LaDuke's response is, Buenos dias, my ass, and got into an argument and then came to our office and we filed this lawsuit that eventually was uh, uh, successful and resulted in the uh, issuance of an injunction that prohibited this particular practice. Uh, there were a whole lot of other cases along the way, uh, but uh, LaDuke, I think, was certainly one of the most significant legally. And as a follow-up to the, my, my question about the, you know, the, the sheriff who arrested us, Geo Scotty Ray, he later wound up working as chief of security at the Seattle Art Museum. And I was, became a judge in 1988, and in 1996, for the first and last time, I had a contested election where someone had filed uh, a, uh, uh, against me to run in the next election as a judge. And I get this phone call at the office. He said, is this the same Michael Fox I arrested in 1971 in Walla Walla, Washington? And I said, well, yes, it is. He says, well, I saw a campaign poster for you, and I always thought it was dumb to arrest you, and I thought you were a pretty good guy, but I was, I was carrying out my order, so I'm going to send you a campaign contribution. And I, I was flabbergasted. And uh, he contacted me, and I... Uh, uh, we sort of became friends, and uh, about two years after that, in I think 1998, after I won the election, he called me and he said, uh, you know, I'm getting married, and would you perform my marriage ceremony? And I said, I'd be delighted. So I went up to Whidbey Island and performed uh, this marriage ceremony for uh, George and his now wife Martha. And uh, it was so, some of those things just I, I'll remember forever. But I just want to express my gratitude uh, to WSU, uh, to uh, Leapy Turner Raman, to Erwin Nash, to Mike Fong and Laura Solis, who discovered these photographs and put them online and led to this uh, development of this wonderful collection, a few samples of which you can see in the exhibit back there. It has really brought for me back a lot of memories. And it's made me think about uh, the, the relationships I had with some of my clients who were also my heroes. And there are, very few, there are very few lawyers who can say that about the people that they represented during the course of their career. I genuinely feel that. I went on from, uh, I mean, I did represent farm workers in the Valley until I became a judge. But I also wound up, because of that work, being hired to represent uh, black construction workers in Seattle under the leadership of a guy named Tyree Scott, who was, uh, was instrumental in desegregating the Seattle building trades. And I went on to do that work uh, for my entire legal career. And uh, as I said, 
uh, it's wonderful to be able to say that your clients were your heroes. Thank you. We'll take any questions, I believe. Yeah, we have a few minutes for questions if anyone has questions. I do have a question. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, how did you meet Erwin Nash? Did you meet him in Seattle or when he came roommate. out? Uh, oh, okay. Erwin, Erwin had already been going over to the Yakima Valley for, I think, since 1967. And in 1968, his photographs were featured in a uh, Seattle, magazine. Seattle Magazine article, which had the title, The Shame of This Valley. And there was a lot of text about farm workers, and there were pictures of these horrible labor camps uh, and filth in, the, in this place. And the article got a lot of attention on the west side of the mountains. And so I met Irwin almost as soon as I went to the valley. He was there taking pictures. Yeah, he was, uh, he was everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's not very tall and, you know, very quiet and just with a huge camera, you know, taking pictures of everything that was going on. He's quite a guy, you know. He's, uh, he's from a Polish-Jewish background. His parents, uh, you know, had to flee Poland because of the Holocaust. And, and uh, so they really instilled in him a sense of justice. And, you know, <clears throat> what he saw in the valley offended that sense. So he's a really good guy. Any other questions? Any other questions? I mean, we'd be happy to answer anything. Yes? I can't hear it. What was the, the day your interaction with that tall Yakima County Sheriff? Oh, it was, it was probably like September 7th or 8th, 1970. Uh, it was before, I mean, it was my first day that I was out there, and I think it was just after Labor Day in 1970. Okay. What, what, what day was the interaction with the deputy sheriff in Yakima? Yeah. Actually, the, as Michael said, the, the cops were, sheriffs were pretty decent, you know. We had expected, you know, to be uh, beat up like they did in California, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, they did show up, and, and, and we uh, didn't give them any cause also because we, you know, uh, forgot to mention that the philosophy of Cesar Chavez and the farm workers was uh, total, total nonviolence, you know, so we didn't do anything to, pro you know, to provoke them. And, you know, they reciprocated in kind. I think they appreciated that. Anybody? I have another question. Sure. <laughs> um, how would you say the state of unions are today? Oh, God. Well, <laughs> I can answer that. Go, go right ahead. Here. Yeah. yeah. You, you know, when I joined the Farm Workers Union, the, it, the goal of Farm Workers Union was to get unionized like industrial workers uh, and get all the rights and protections of industrial workers. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, the, you know, business has a lot of power and they have a lot of friends in Congress, and now private employers, uh, there's only like six, at, at that time, you know, Tim Caesar was organizing, was the, the, the union density among industrial employers was about 35 to 40%. Now it's 6%, you know, so they've been going downhill. And you've seen it all, you know, Starbucks, uh, 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 Amazon, uh, it, uh, Walmart, they just refuse to negotiate, and, and uh, the law has, you know, the, the law has been, the National Labor Relations Act has been turned on its head, so now they actually use it to stall unionization by filing endless claims and, and, and protests, and they made a lot of stuff that, that was formerly very effective, you know, illegal, you know. For, for example, now they allow employers to go in and require that worker attend mandatory captive audience speeches, you know, two or three times a day, where they bring in anti-union consultants and they just harangue the, you know, they just talk bad mouth the union and stuff, yet they, would, they don't allow union organizers to go in, and that's, that's uh, so the, the stacks are really, uh, really turned against them, but, you know, I, I guess I'm still hopeful, you know, I wouldn't have been an organizer or stayed at this business for long if I hadn't been, 
but it, it seemed to think that that babies at tight is beginning to turn, you know, that whether visit, you know, Amazon warehouses in Staten Island just got, you know, voted uh, for, for a union, and the people that did it were just individual workers, you know. The leader was a guy that had been fired for leading a protest, uh, you know, uh, against unsafe COVID restrictions, and uh, the uh, Amazon, the, Starbucks employees all over the place now are, are, are starting to get unionized. I think, you know, maybe we've hit rock bottom, bottom and, and, you know, so that workers just can't take it anymore. So it, it's, it's pretty bad. The public employees, you know, are a lot higher. They're about, you know, 30, 40 percent unionized. And, uh, you know, because they're, you know, they tend to be work for government or schools and, and you know, they don't have the, the aggressive uh, uh, streak in them that just, just, you know, goes all out to try to defeat unionization. So it's, it's, uh, so the, the status is, is bad, but slowly improving. Even among farm workers, I mentioned the, the tulip workers, you know, as I said, are, you know, are, you know, uh, indigenous workers now that are starting to unionize and, uh, the, yeah, anyway, that's it. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And oh, yes, please take refreshments. Please help yourselves. Yeah, and we'll, we'll be here for a while. Yeah.